answering your questions. You are listening to No Other Doctrine. This radio on demand show is pre recorded. Like the Great Wall of China or the Pyramids of Giza, our faith should stand the test of time. To do that, it needs to be built on a firm foundation of solid doctrine. The Apostle Paul urges us in 1 Timothy 4.15 to give our attention to reading, exhortation, and to doctrine. And that's never been more important than it is now. Welcome to No Other Doctrine. This is your opportunity to call in with your questions on doctrine, religion, and reasons for our faith. You can call now at 338-5790 during the next hour. Pastor Scott Tom will answer your questions as we discover why doctrines of the Bible are the only ones that will remain for all eternity. Call with your questions now, 338-5790, and join us for no other doctrine. And good morning. Welcome to No Other Doctrine on 107.1 FM. It is uh, just after 9 o'clock. I'm Steve Ryman. It is cold outside, and we're going to reach a high today in the 40s. So bundle up as you go out. But as you go out, uh, uh, keep it tuned here. And we I was going to say get your cell phone ready, but if you're driving, you can't do that. So be ready to think about that parking lot you're going to pull into. Call in and ask a question this morning with Pastor Scott. Uh, we've got a great morning ahead of us, though. And we leave the phone lines open at 338-5790, 338-5790 for your calls throughout the hour. If you're new to the broadcast, uh, here's what we do. We spend a, a good portion of the beginning of the broadcast going through systematic theology uh, curriculum and uh and then uh, opening up the phone lines to your calls. Although, uh, like a classroom setting, we do leave the phone lines there throughout the hour that you can uh, kind of raise your hand and ask the question you might have about this week's uh, topic. And uh, we'll uh, do that for you at 338-5790. And in studio with us, as always, Pastor Scott Tom of Cross Christian Fellowship here in the Albuquerque area. They meet at uh, uh, the Winrock Six Theaters on Indian School. That's just east of Louisiana uh, near Winrock Mall. And uh, that at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And then Pastor Scott, uh, folks can tune in for Cross Points, a half-hour broadcast heard tonight at 8.30, as well as Sunday mornings at 10.30. So a couple of great opportunities to uh, get into one of the studies available. Well, top of the morning to you. Morning. <laughs> yeah, we've got, uh, we're on the radio three times on the weekend, so uh, you're inundated with uh, Cross Fellowship and and studies, and uh, we appreciate the people who call in, and I want to encourage them to call in. <clears throat> We're going to give away some uh, tickets uh, for a bowling night. Family and fun night. Family fun night. Sch- and- scheduled uh, later this month. It's March 22nd, and it's going to be at Sandia Bowl up in the Northeast Heights at Lexi- Lexington and Wantabo. Uh So how good a bowler are you? Are you a ringer? No. <laughs> I'm not. You can have little bumper I, pads. I, I was in a league like 20 years ago. Yeah. And um, I'm nowhere clear, close to where I was. So it's mostly about the fun. We we have fellowship. And, and uh, although I did get two two strikes in a row bowling behind nice. my back last week. One strike away the from last time turkey. we did that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but that was behind my back. Nice. Yeah. Between the legs, not so good. Yeah. Now, all these people that just picked up the Nintendo Wii this year yeah. and are bowling. Have you seen this? Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. are bowling on their Nintendo Wii. And they can do the English and everything, so they'll be all warmed up and ready to come down. Warmed up and ready to go, but it's a different thing when you're live, (laughs) in person. The pins are staring you back in the face. That's right. It's not so easy. (laughs) Now, what these tickets that we're giving away is each caller uh, uh, this morning that that calls in with a question for Pastor Scott on the air. Uh, Once we get you on the air, we're going to get a ticket to you. And our producer, Felicia, who, by the way, we want to thank for coming in diligently each week to help us get on the air. Uh, she'll uh, get you the information on how to get this ticket. Each ticket is good for two adults or an adult and a child uh, to attend uh, the Family Fun Night with Cross Christian Fellowship. Again, that's March 22nd from 7 until 9 that evening. And uh, keep listening to this show each Saturday for more details on that. Or they can call the church number, I'm sure, to, to get more information, Pastor Scott. Right. 821-6032. And uh, you can get some um, 
leave a message or ask for the information on that. And uh, there's information online as well uh, about that to what's happening page on crossfellowship.org. Okay, and as we leave the phone lines open for those questions this morning at 338-5790, Pastor Scott, where are we headed in the curriculum today? You know, we've been looking at the character and nature of God, and we looked at his love, his holiness, righteousness, and his justice, and we're going to touch on truth today. And this topic really uh, grabs me as well, because truth is something that everybody's really looking for. They want to know what is real in life. What am I doing here? How am I going to meet my aspirations, the desires of my heart, and what is my life going to be worth when it's all said and done? Now, they may not think this on a regular basis, but it's always there a little bit in the subconscious that I want uh, my life to mean something. And here when Jesus in John fourteen six says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, it, it, it's so full of meaning there. And one of the things about truth and understanding truth is that when you're dealing with God, you're dealing with absolutes. And so when he says truth, he, he means that this is what's true now and for always. Uh, One of the definitions of truth is a fact or belief that is accepted as to how reality actually is. So people are searching for meaning. So what do you do? They, you know, like shows before us and after us, they try to eat healthy or be healthy and get the most out of life. But still, there's there's more to that. Um, Physical exercise does profit, but... Not as much as spiritual um, exercise, spiritual uh, spirituality, I should say. And so they grasp for things out there. But it doesn't really correspond to reality after a while that they're in it or they're doing this. And, and the, so they have to bend their perception because the hope is so strong for that. So some people end up in a cult or they end up in a world religion. And they're, they're trying for the nirvana, they're trying for the peace, or they're trying to earn their way to salvation or whatever it is, but it just doesn't fit. It doesn't correspond to uh, what truth and reality really is and what our heart and what the perception of life is. So they'll end up with the way uh, struggling in a legalistic viewpoint, trying to earn their salvation, and always falling short and ending up in depression and struggling and fear. And, you know, you have an extremely high um, suicide rate in some of the top um, uh, cults. And so uh, what you end up with is they're, they're trying to get there. They're trying to get to the truth, but in a, in a wrong fashion, and you always get frustrated. What's so exciting about Christianity and about Jesus and about God is that <clears throat> it proves that it's real because it corresponds in every sense to life. The Bible's not a scientific book. I didn't mean it as that. Yet it's 100% accurate in science. You know, from uh, ancient days, they thought the world was flat. And the, and the Bible always called the world uh, Earth a sphere. They thought that the stars were finite, that you, uh, well, they are in a, in a sense, but they, they thought that you could just count them, uh, you know, in, in the evening and you'd have the number. And yet we find out that God says they're innumerable. They're, they're like the sands of the, uh, the sea. You know, there is a finite number, but to count them, to, to, we're never going to see the ends of the universe and all the expansion be able to count all of them. And that the uh, heavens are, you know, constantly expanding. It's interesting that the scripture says that um, God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. And and what's really interesting is that as they look on that and they see the dark matter and the other things that the uh, the uh, uh, cosmologists and others are looking out there, is that they see the... um, space going out there in in almost a ripple form, kind of like you would in pulling back a curtain, that the farther you stretch out the curtain, the less 
pleading there is in, in it. And that um, they see it as, as a space almost unfolding a little bit. It's amazing how accurate God's Word is. And in, in all these areas that we <clears throat> operate in, excuse me, that the world is um, fits right and perfectly in with Scripture. And so as when Jesus says, We're, I'm the way and the truth, it isn't just that he's the only true Messiah, that he's um, truly God. It, it, it encompasses everything that we can trust him in life and um, in everything his word says. It will not pass away. And that doesn't mean just in the prophecies. That means in all the areas of life and faith and practice and the way we do things. And so we have um, a perspective on life that uh, is the correct worldview. It fits reality. And so when God says um, statements, you can take that those statements are true. They are reliable. His words um, are faithful, and he will display this time and time and time again. So there's three basic implications for uh, us when we look at God and God's truth. One is because God is eternal. His truth is eternal. That means his word is true, and all his dealings with man are true and reliable. And God does not go back in his word. Psalm uh, 119.89 says this, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So when he says something, uh, we have truth, and because God is eternal, that's, that's truth forever. We, it doesn't change. It's not masked. It's, it's something that we can hang our hat on and truly hold on to, and that's how we can be steadfast and full of hope because it is true for eternity. And because he is truth, then he can be the true object of our love and worship. You know, we're never going to be disappointed. We're never going to be ashamed in putting our love and faith and worship into God. John four twenty three and 24 says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we have the true living God. And that corresponds to reality everything that he's given us. And so we don't worship him with manufactured things, with idols, with uh, a false heart, with false words. He wants us to worship him. And what this means is strictly from your heart that what you're going to say to him, you truly mean. And he doesn't want um, you to go up and make offerings or do other things that would normally appease so-called false gods. He wants our hearts. He wants to see us in truth. So he would much rather hear your open heart and it not be, excuse me, not be perfect worship, uh, but it's true worship rather than all these platitudes and you go on like the Pharisees who make long prayers here in the marketplace or um, at a meeting And it's meaningless because they're doing it not towards God. They're doing it so that they can be heard from man and people can go, oh, man, that guy can light it up in prayer. That guy uh, has got a relationship with God and, man, listen to the words that he's saying. God would rather have you use some kind of broken English, which he'll understand, uh, rather and have your heart rather than that. Not to put down speaking correctly, but you understand this is what he means by truth and to be worshipped in truth. And um, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Why does it make you free? And people think that this is just from sin. 
that you know the truth and you, and you get saved and you're freed from sin. And that is true. And most of us have experienced that. There may be some that are listening in. You've never experienced that. You've never uh, experienced the true and the living God and, and have that freedom uh, uh, from the burden of sin that's been weighing on your back, the guilt that's there, and this idea of, of running from God, which we can't do, but we, we tend to hide from him or put our head in the sand. There is a, f- a freedom in that, but there's also a freedom in knowing truly what's right and what's wrong, truly how you should spend your life and your time and your efforts, because that gives you a real satisfaction and freedom so when you go to sleep at night, you could be satisfied knowing that, you know what? I, I had meaning in my life today because I lived it unto God. I, the work that I did before, I was grumbling and I was, I was hating it. But now because I did my work unto God and not as a man pleaser, not just um, to my bosses and, and act busy when they're around, but I did it unto God, you can be satisfied. There's such freedom in the truth and in worshiping him in a true way. And that isn't just songs. That's in doing a good and, and, and wonderful job uh, at your workplace or at home or as a student. And you did. I did the best that I could because I did this test. I did this, this housework or made this meal or served a client because I was doing it as I was doing it unto God. And so then it gives meaning. Then there's a reward in that because you're doing it as part of worship. And God rewards us for that, which we we shouldn't deserve it because we don't deserve anything. But he does reward us for, for having that type of heart. And it will change lives. It changes your whole perspective on life. William Jenkins says this, truth reforms as well as informs. So this this is something that is, when you grasp this along with God's love, of how if you truly trust in him, you truly trust in his word, and know that because it's true that you can rely on it, but also because God is loving that you can trust that it is the best thing for you. Because being the most loving being, he's always going to have the most loving attitude towards you. And in doing so, he's going to choose the best things for you. Which is really neat when we get into uh, prophecy and we get into predestination and other areas like that, of how God works, and you're able to trust him in all kinds of things, like who is my spouse going to be? And where am I going to live or where am I going to work? All those things um, you can lay in, in his hands because he loves you so much and he's 100% truthful. And that truth will truly set us free in so many different areas. So this is part of systematic theology. When you go in and you're not going verse by verse, I love going verse by verse. But you also need to put the the points together. All these points that are done throughout Scripture have to come together, and and it helps you learn about God. Not to be puffed up, but to fall in love with Him over and over again. When you see His um, nature, when you see His love, He's just awesome. And when you do that, you, you you can truly trust Him. Now, why didn't He just... Lay it all out in one book. Here's the book of theology. Well, because God put together the Bible in such a way that you can't tamper with it. It is tamper-proof. And one of the ways that you uh, encode messages and make sure that they get there is that you put uh, parts of it in multiple uh, messages that you're sending out. They would do this in World War One and World War Two, And what happens is is that... You don't get the complete message in one transmission, but you get a, a, a part of it. And if transmissions are being um, intercepted, um, that message isn't getting through to a person, they don't have the full message uh, as the enemy. And you may not have the full message, but you're getting the other parts of it. You can put it together. 
because you've, you've got that. God has done the same thing with the Bible. So every time people try to manipulate the Bible, they always get in trouble because there's there's when they change one area, there's hundreds of other places that will contradict what they just um, changed. Hence, you have multiple um, changes, up to 5,000 in the New World Translation that the Jehovah's Witnesses use. Why? Because every time you change something, uh, it'll it'll uh, and it's against Scripture. It's going to be shown to be false um, dozens of other places. So you got to go change that. But once you change that, and because that has a another part of another message about God, then you got to change multiple other. And so now it goes up exponentially. So as you go through, um, it, you begin to contradict yourself, and you won't have the proper message. So. We're we're next w- week. We're going to jump into Christology. We're going to start studying Jesus, uh, his nature. Um, it's exactly as God because he is God. So we're not going to cover so much the aspect of love and and of his character so much, but things like how could he be a hundred percent man and a hundred percent God? Uh, how does that work? Then uh, how did incarnation work? How did it begin? Did he exist before that? Was he Michael the Archangel? Eh, not. So we'll dig into those things and, and show you reasons why that cannot be. And um, we're going to come up on a break pretty soon, but you can call in 338-5790. And I know there's people with questions out there. There was things happening this week, hint, hint, that people <laughs> might have questions about. And uh, I do have an email question I want I want to get to because it's a question we get over... Um, and over. It's a number of times we'll get this, and it's another Christian myth that uh, comes up, uh, and we'll, we'll get into that that question uh, in just a little bit. I do want to remind the listener that uh, it's your opportunity to ask those questions you have, either about the things that uh, Pastor Scott mentioned uh, this morning as we went through the curriculum, uh, or, uh, as he mentioned, the, the current issues uh, going on uh I think this weekend on the the Discovery Channel, it'll be James Cameron uh, talking about uh, this supposed tomb of Jesus and his family. And uh, uh, I know folks have questions about that. Uh, we'll take your calls on it at 338-5790. Each of the, the listeners this morning that call in with a question that we get on the air with, uh, we'll uh, provide you with a ticket to attend the Family Fun Night with Cross Christian Fellowship March 22nd at Sandia Bowl at 11342 Lexington Northeast. Uh, that's at Lexington and one to Bow. And uh, it, it's a ticket that's good for two adults or an adult with a child. Uh, and that includes two hours of bowling in the shoes and all the fun and fellowship. You know, uh, as we prepare for that night, uh, Pastor Scott, I, I want to remind folks, you've already had a couple of real great outings uh, at Wex with some of the couples that have gone out with you guys. And uh, the, those those uh, nighttime activities have just been a lot of fun. Uh, they're a lot of fun. And we try to do that to promote the fellowship part of, you know, serving God and just having fun. And we do. We have a, a lot of fun. We laugh and um, do different things. And this is part of the things that we go out and do. And it's, a, it's also a way for us to get into the community. Uh-huh. So we could do things at our church. Well, right now we can't because we're in a theater. <laughs> but before we had a, a storefront building that we you, we could always do things there. But I chose to do as much as possible we could out in the world uh, to be that influence, to get engage people in conversations. And a lot of times we do when we're out there. But we have a lot of fun. We're laughing and stuff. And I hadn't included the a lot of laughing that night. Yeah, and I hadn't included listen. Yeah, and we have fun. So you you may end up with the pig or the cape or something like that. So if you get a strike or something, we make you wear funny costumes. And, nice, and uh, it's hilarious. But um, and then at the end, we we get kind of fleshly because everybody's fighting over the uh, the cape. You know, whoever gets the last strike gets to keep the costume. Sweet. So, yeah, just letting people know. So it might come down to fisty cuffs. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Never take me seriously. I mean, even when we're covering Only, scripture, yeah, yeah, then you can take him seriously. Take me serious, but um, you're still supposed to check everything by the word. Okay, so as we're going through that, just a reminder: you're responsible for knowing doctrine and for serving God, and to checking truth. So even check what I'm saying, and 
and do that. But we, we have a lot of uh, fun. And I haven't included the listeners before. We just include. And it's been a blessing to me that people who call in, hey, remember, I, I gave you this question on the air. And and it, it's been really fun. And then we end up usually doing a question fest. So How fun. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll be March 22nd. We have tickets for those calling into the show today at 338-5790. You can also send your emails to question at nootherdoctrine.org. And uh, we'll go out to the phone lines and uh, catch up with our first caller. Maddie uh, is on the line. And uh, Pastor Scott, you mentioned uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, during the curriculum this morning. And uh, Maddie has a question uh, kind of aimed in that direction. Maddie, welcome into No Other Doctrine. You're on with Pastor Scott Tom. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, well, thanks for letting me ask the question on the air. But I just, um, I'm going to be talking with some Jehovah's Witnesses this next week about the Trinity. And so I was wanting to know some really good, um, some good proofs and some good arguments to give them that would... Um, you know, to give an answer for the reason why we believe in the Trinity. And I've already done some research, but I just wanted to know what you would suggest. Well, without being uh, self-placating and uh, pushing our website, Maddie, it's a good question because on the website I have like a um, generic article on the Trinity. And it's mainly there to be used for... Um, the cults like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses who will hold to uh, at least believe in the Bible. And most of the time they'll use the Old Testament uh, or the King James Version as you know their text. Now they'll say we can only believe it so far as it's correctly interpreted, which is they're out to not believe it at all. But on there, um, in that article on the Trinity, I take... Um, scriptures that uh, talk about God having exclusive rights in a certain area. He's God is the only one who gives life uh, and uh, causes to die. And uh, if you go and you look up places, you'll see that, hey, the Spirit gives life as well. Jesus gives life as well. So therefore, if God is the only one who does it, the three must be one. And mm-hmm. it'll cover, so what you do is you get to them to agree on that first verse, that God says, I'm the Savior, the only Savior, there is no other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, you say, do, well, do you, do you agree on that, that Jehovah or Yahweh or however they want to pronounce it is the Savior and there is no other? Then you take them to the other places where it says that through the work of the Holy Spirit we're saved, or uh, obviously that Jesus is Savior. It, it it puts them in a quandary because God makes this exclusive claim in a number of places, uh, like um, uh, being the only Savior or being the only one who could uh, proclaim the future. And yet we see the same things with Jesus, same, see the same things with the Holy Spirit, Creator. And when you have that exclusive statement and then these other two are doing the same, it's a different way of arguing the Trinity for somebody. And so they see that the either you have a contradiction there or that the three are one, that you have compound unity. Great. You know, that's really helpful because I was kind of already starting to go on that line because they believe that that God created Jesus, but then Jesus created everything else. And um, Jehovah God, you know, just created everything, you know, didn't direct create everything. And yet in the scripture, it talks about how God alone is creator. And so, and then it talks about Jesus creating, so how can that be? Hello? Right. Yeah, Maddie, oh, okay. that, that's, a, that's a good way of doing it. I was, I'm sorry, I was looking up um, a scripture here. If you, um, one of the best things to do, um, see, I lost my Bible here. <clears throat> one of the best things to do when you're working with, uh, them and you're covering this area is when you get into John chapter one when they'll usually come back and say that well God created Jesus but then he created Jesus um, or, or he used Jesus to create everything else but in John chapter one they you're gonna you're gonna fall into a um, 
they're going to fall into a difficulty as they get there. And part of that is, is that it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life mm. was the light of men. Okay. When you get to verse 3, right. it, it puts all created things in the category of being made by Jesus. And then it says, and this is what's so cool about Scripture, is that then it, it affirms it using the negative. And without him, nothing was made that was mm-hmm. made. So what he's saying here is that, <clears throat> that everything that could possibly be made was made by Jesus. Anything made was made by him. Therefore, he couldn't be created because he can't create himself. Right. And so you've got a, logically, a logical dilemma and I've used this a couple times with Jehovah's Witnesses at the door, and they're expecting me to go into verse one of John one one, and when they they're gonna um, uh, look that God was or Jesus was a God, and so they're all fired up to argue that, <clears throat> and I bring it back into verse three, and and what it does is really throw them for a loop because it puts, and I explain it this way: you have a category, like you have a circle, now. In the circle, it says created things. Now, how many things do we put in there? And if you read the scripture, it says that all things. I said all things. Now, does that mean what? That What does all mean to you? And they'll usually mean like everything. I said, okay, so we put everything in here. Jesus created everything. Now, is Jesus in that circle? Could he create himself? And the obvious answer is no. It's impossible to uh, come into existence to create yourself when you're not in existence. So <clears throat> that's another way of going about it. So that's a oh. great question. And uh, it's good that you're at the door answering these people, Maddie, and, and doing a, a work because you'll be planting seeds. And every Christian who does that in love is, is really uh, performing a work of God because he loves these people. He wants to reach them. They've been blinded by the enemy. And the way you uncover those scales... Uh, besides praying for them, the way you uncover their scales is by by giving them scripture and, and good reason. And then what happens is many times the light hits them and they're able to see where they were once blind. Now they see and that word will then start convicting them. And it maybe not won't happen right in the doorstep, but sometimes weeks down the road or years down the road, those things stick in and <clears throat> nag at them. I've talked to... Jehovah's Witnesses who who have it's taken like sometimes 10, 12 years for them to come to the Lord, but they remember a conversation 10 years ago with somebody at the doorstep that they just could not get over. And so the work that you're doing is is awesome. When every time we engage those people in love, uh, we're blessing God. Wow. Does that well, help you out, you. Maddie? That helps so much, and I, I so appreciate the encouragement. Thank you. And, you know, and Maddie, this isn't, uh, it sounds like maybe it's not the first time you visited with them. Um, no, we're actually meeting on a, a weekly or semi-weekly basis. Okay. So, well, you're probably already aware of this, but, and Pastor uh, Scott, you know, keep me in line if if if, uh, if you haven't found this to be true. But when dealing with, with someone uh, that's uh, that's in a cult, you know, oftentimes in a discussion, uh, you'll start to head down, you know, the road you said you were going to. And when you start to defend the faith like Pastor Scott's prepared you for, oftentimes they'll want to take a turn. Okay, well, let's look at this. And <laughs> and it's really important, I think, uh, uh, that, you know, that we, in a gentle way, control the conversation and say, well, that's another good topic and we should have that Bible study sometime. However, let's stick to the topic that we were discussing. Yeah, keep them, uh, they make a truth claim. They deny the Trinity, so they, that, that's a truth claim, even though it's a negative truth claim. Make them prove it. And not just you, but make th- them prove it. And mm. here's what the scripture says. Um, how, could you, um, how could you prove it otherwise? And what they really run into, almost every cult runs into the problem of, they don't offer anything better. If you tell them, hey, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm going to heaven, I've been filled with this Holy Spirit, he's changed my life, what more could you offer? And that's the at the point where they're going to have to say that they're not Christian. They're going to have to exclude themselves from what the Bible says because they're going to have to say, you're not saved, 
or they're going to have to say um, that um, they're different from from Christians because each one of those um, cults are really trying to portray themselves as Christian. And so oh, yeah. when, when you do that, what will happen is then they're stuck in a barrel because to show you that they have something better, they have to show you that you're wrong or that you're not saved, and then, then they are going directly against Scripture. So, Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. That's a good point, because when I was talking with these women, one of them looked at me straight and said, we don't believe we can earn our salvation. And she went straight down the line and said, you know, we're sinners and we can't do anything good enough. And it was like, wow, they, that was like textbook evangelicalism. And I was like, well, that's really interesting. Right. Yeah, so, and unfortunately they say that, but that's that's, that's not their doctrine. And right. w- what they do, the, the way they get people to believe that is they, they change the definition of those words for the people. And mm. so as they, the, the connotation for them of salvation and earning your way is different from what a Christian understands it and the way Scripture is. And so they'll, they'll say it in earnest, but it's not the same thing. And, and it's one of the best ways of brainwashing somebody and that the enemy used to do um, in the different wars, especially in uh, World War I, is they would, they would use terms that the other uh, army would use but begin to put a negative connotation to it uh, and change it so that they, when the, uh, when, like Tokyo Rose would do this all the time, and that when the soldiers would hear that then, after they'd been in captivity so long, they would use things like dog face or grunt as a put down and that they're, they're just using you like puppets are going out there. And so now they start hearing things that were kind of endearing before, even though they're a little bit sarcastic. Now th- they're hearing this uh, from either the radio waves or whatever messages they get to hear. <clears throat> they have, um, now they have a different definition of that word than they used to, and it, it destroys their faith in their country or in their commanding officer, or those type of things. And so they, they use the same, the, this is nothing but uh, brainwashing techniques. Hmm. Yeah, and which okay. you, you've run into and you probably know. Oh, you know, I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning as I go. Well, Maddie, thanks for your call, and uh, we hope to hear from you again uh, if you've got more questions, uh, or maybe feedback on how things are going with your, your time spent uh, during these studies. Okay, well, thank you so much. All right, thank you, Maddie. And uh, that leaves a phone line open for you at 338-5790. And, of course, Maddie and all the uh, rest of the callers today uh, will get uh, that family fun night pass for Sandia Bowl for the uh, March 22nd event with Cross Christian Fellowship. If you want to be a part of that, 338-5790 with your question this morning on No Other Doctrine. Uh, And we'll come back from the break and take your calls. 338-5790. Thanks for listening to No Other Doctrine. We'll be right back on KNKT. This episode of No Other Doctrine is not live, but you can connect with us right now on Facebook. We want to hear from you. Become part of our community. Also, on the No Other Doctrine website, you can see the full show notes and take advantage of other free downloads. That's NoOtherDoctrine.org. Again, NoOtherDoctrine.org. Well, welcome back into No Other Doctrine. This is Steve Ryman with Pastor Scott Tom, and uh, we uh, were able to come in and, and take your calls every Saturday morning from 9 till 10 o'clock, as well as go through uh, some curriculum uh, looking at systematic theology, and we've done that this morning, uh, but are taking not only your phone calls, but your emails. We want to remind you, uh, as folks uh, call in uh, this morning at 338-5790, those going on the air with a question will get one of those passes to the Family Fun Night uh, with the folks at uh, Cross Christian Fellowship. It'll be at Sandia Bowl on March 22nd at 7 o'clock. A lot of fun uh, planned for that night, so we hope to see you there. Uh, but uh, emails as well, you can send those to question at NoOtherDoctrine.org, and uh, Pastor Scott, someone's done that this morning. Yeah, they've emailed in um, a question, and the question is really one that we get in a number uh, of cases, and uh, the emailer didn't um, give me permission to use their name on the air, so I'll, their question, though, basically is about generational sin. And they asked, is, it, um, is this a Christian doctrine? Do we um, 
actually have sins that get passed on from generation to generation. And it really stems from uh, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. There's a couple other places in Scripture where it talks about it. And it says, For you shall make uh, not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, am your God. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commands. Now, the interpretation generally is this in Christian churches, is that this is when they cite this Exodus chapter 20, and remember this is where the Ten Commandments are being given to Israel, that they say that the sins of the fathers fathers are visited upon the children to the thir- third and fourth generation, that this is uh, commonly means that there's ancestral curses, that the activities of the fathers um, have been passed on to the children, and this means something like uh, usually some kind of extreme sin, um, maybe an occult uh, involvement. Uh, somebody has uh, uh, murder in their family, and then the generations later somebody has an abortion, and this is part of the uh, generational sin that's being passed on from from uh, person to person. And so they usually tell them that they need to solve this problem or get rid of it uh, by some spiritual dynamic, spiritual teaching that they say the person needs to repent and confess the sins of their fathers and um, go through some rigmarole. There's whole books that are written about, about this. This is a false interpretation of Scripture. This is one of those places where it, it, it it's a Christian myth, it's, it, and it gets perpetuated, and they never break down the scripture. I mean, let's look at the scripture here. First of all, here's this, what, what they think is this, this is a sin that's being passed on, and it, that God is visiting this sin upon each generation. Well, if uh, if we're going to fight against it, if we're going to come against the sin or do something, who are we actually fighting against? Who's visiting this sin upon, uh, or this iniquity upon the people? Well, it's God. And so we would actually be fighting against God, first and foremost, when you, when you look against it. But this is not visiting, uh, a sin. Visiting the iniquity is not causing a person to sin. Um, this, uh, curse isn't passed down from one generation to another. So what their interpretation would be if they broke it down and began to tell you is that this person sinned, therefore God has caused that gene or that that uh, propensity to sin or actually is causing people to sin. Well, that means that God would be tempting the next generation because th- that temptation is passed on by genes. It doesn't matter whether it's a temptation outside the body or inside the body and uh, that or that God is causing them to sin. Well, James 1, 13 through 14 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Not the desires of the parents, but their own desires. <clears throat> so, Christians obviously don't fall into this category. So, look at the qualifier. Who is God punishing then? Those who hate him. So if you're a Christian and you have a problem with sin, <clears throat> can you say that God uh, is going to then, um, that's something that God has allowed to be passed on? <clears throat> Excuse me. Of course not. Because Christians aren't in the category of those who hate him. And also we see uh, in Ezekiel that God addresses this whole notion that the children are punished because of the, the guilt of their parents. That's not true. Ezekiel 18.20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So, who is God punishing here? And it's obviously punishment. Well, he's, he's punishing those who hate him. Those who... Uh, turn away from God, those who set up idols. And who is he talking to in context here? 
He's talking to Israel. And we so we know and we see that Israel um, is uh, has at times strayed from God. And we can also see that when they do, it fits into this verse that, uh, you know, when any any generation turns from God and God punishes that generation, unfortunately, it's going to pa- be passed down to the third and fourth generation in the sense of they suffer for the iniquity of their parents as a consequence of their parents, not that they inherit that sin. So if I'm punished and I'm an older gentleman and I have children, my ch- children will feel the effects of it. So will my uh, grandchildren, it, it, and maybe grand, great grandchildren, but it'll never go beyond that because it's rare that you'd have great great grandchildren. And here in uh, Deuteronomy, in the very same book, he uses that as an example: "Take heed to yourself, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and He shut up heaven so that there will be no rain." And the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord has given you. And uh, his anger is aroused against them because it was turned. And what we see here, then again, to fit into this whole passage, Exodus thirty-two, thirty-four. Now therefore go, lead the people to the place of which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day... When I visit for punishment, I will visit punishment upon them for their sin. See how the sin is connected with punishment and visiting iniquity. When God says he visits iniquity, it doesn't mean that he takes part in it or that he passes it on. It means that he punishes it. It means that he approaches us in our sin and corrects us. That's what visiting iniquity is and how it's defined in Scripture. Scripture defines Scripture. Therefore, voila. You have the the definition of this. I know we've had this call uh, a couple of times already this year, and I've got, received this email. So I thought I would break it down in its context and give us a a longer answer rather than just a no, so that it once and for all, you know, we kind of have a at least on one broadcast, it's there. And maybe I'll post this as one of our articles online. All right, and you can find those at nootherdoctrine.org on the web. And uh, Pastor Scott also mentioned. Uh, uh, look at the Trinity that you'd find there in uh, uh, the earlier call with Maddie, who's going to be talking to Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, as you go to the website, uh, make sure you have your Adobe uh, Acrobat Reader, your free version of that, uh, downloaded onto your computer, as that article is in a PDF uh, format. Uh, yes, PDF format. So um, that just means that you, you and you are able to download it right. and print it out. Right. Uh, and that will help you, and you can hand it out. So when they come to the door and they say, well, uh, here's the Awake magazine or here's this uh, article or here's something, would you would you accept it? You say, sure, and I've got something for you. Would you take that? Oftentimes they won't. Oh, no, we can't, we can't do that. And then I'll, I'll just, depending on, on the the person, sometimes they'll be point blank and say, you know, that's, that's a uh, prime example of brainwashing. You're not allowed to see any information outside of, uh, what the Watchtower says or what Utah says or whatever group they're a part of. Right, where you're actually able to take uh, uh, whatever they might hand you and, and hold it up to the light of Scripture and see, uh, well, we're actually where the flaws are. <laughs> because we've we've got the, the truth, Amen. right? And so because of that, um, then um, we can examine everything, and, and what we have will stand up against anything, anything. So now on that topic, uh, we've got a phone call this morning at three three eight five seven nine zero, and uh, David has been listening and probably heard our call with Maddie and uh, has his own question about the Jehovah's Witnesses. David, thanks so much for calling in this morning at three three eight five seven nine zero. You are on with Pastor Scott Tom. Go ahead with your question. Yes, sir. Um, I, I have a friend that uh, occasionally works with me. I have my own business and. Uh, and sometimes I bring him on to give me a hand, and and his wife is uh is getting into Jehovah's Witness, and her you know her mother's deeply into it, and has probably been in it many years, and uh and now I find my friend uh, Jackson, he's starting to get into it, and every once in a while he tries to tell me something about it, and I tell him just straight out, I say, hey, don't talk to me about Jehovah's Witnesses because it's a cult, 
and uh, and right away he's like, oh, you just don't know what you're talking about. You don't understand it. You don't know anything about it. And so the reason why I'm calling is because I and I'll just hang up after I ask the question. I'll listen to your response on the radio. Uh, I just want to know, plain and simple, bottom line, what what do they believe, and and how does it con- contradict the, the true holy scriptures of the King James version, uh, as I understand it? Thank you. All right. Well, uh, David, okay, thanks. Dave, appreciate the call, and uh, w- w- there. Let's explain what a cult is. A cult is an aberration. They are not in the fold. They uh, have purposely exiled themselves by the doctrines they choose. So you have essentials in Christianity, and essentials are basically if you change that, that ingredient or whatever it is, you change the outcome of the product. You change the uh, stew you're making, and in, in anything... Um, there is or there are essentials, and in Christianity, some of the essentials are that the Bible is the Word of God, that Jesus is God, that Jesus wrote, died for our sins and rose bodily, and uh, the Trinity would be another one. Now, it doesn't mean you you have to understand the Trinity perfectly, but to deny it would put you outside of Christianity because the Scripture teaches it. Now. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that puts them outside of that category? First and, and foremost is that they deny that Jesus is God. They say he is a God. Well, that's um, that's a, uh, a false uh, doctrine. It's not even a bad interpretation. It's just an out-and-out uh, false doctrine. Knowing the truth, they, they uh, reject it. They don't believe in the Trinity. Uh, they believe, for example, that the Holy Spirit is God's impersonal act of force. It's just a, a force. They've, and it's not like these are new doctrines. The Watchtower in 1952 on June 1 made this statement. Um, and the the Watchtower said that they are the only church and they're the self-proclaimed prophet of God. That's in April of 1972. And they're the only channel of God's truth, they said. And that's Watchtower February 15th in 1981. And because of these doctrines that they exclude themselves from Christians. So sometimes people take exe- uh, exception to that, especially Jehovah's Witnesses at your door, you're talking to them and they say, well, we're not a cult, you know, we're, we're Christians. You can say, look, you, your organization has set themselves apart from Christians. You can't be. They're denying they are because they say, for example, that that I used, the Watchtower April 1st in 1972, that the, that the Watchtower Society is the self-proclaimed prophet of God and that they are the only channel of God's truth and that they are the only true church, that only their baptism saves. Well, I don't even have to say they're a cult, that they're not Christians. They have set themselves into that category. So this is one way when somebody comes real defensive is that you can um, look up those articles or you can go to um, different websites. You can get some of this information uh, at, um, there's a good website that's called apologeticsindex.org, apologeticsindex.org, and you can go on there and you can get this information and basically have uh, it... Uh, on hand for the person. They can go look up the articles themselves if they want. And so when they get off in those areas, like saying that um, uh, Jehovah's first creation is Jesus, which we talked about earlier in this broadcast, um, you can use John um, chapter 1, verse 3. But they also deny that Jesus was a perfect man. They believe that he was Michael the archangel, not really um, the son of God. And so they have Differing doctrines, they say he is a god, but yet he's also uh, an archangel. They also say deny that he rose bodily from the dead. Uh, Wake magazine, nineteen seventy three, said that that Jesus did not raise physically; that he was he was a spirit when he was raised. Well, that's central to the Christian doctrine. First um, Corinthians chapter fifteen um, puts that out there as if you don't believe in a bodily resurrection, we have no hope. And Christianity isn't true. Therefore, he had to have raised in a, in a bodily form. Which, by the way, 
I, I want to throw this out on Easter. I'm going to do a special study on the Shroud of Turin. Now, that's something that I, I have not put much stock in. I don't pay attention to that. They found the ossuary of James or something like this. I don't usually get all excited. And the Shroud of Turin I've pr- kind of put off to the side. And, you know, I don't need that for my faith because we have the scriptures, we have uh, extra biblical evidence that's out there, we have the testimony of the wit of the witnesses that were there, which is very, very compelling. However, recent technology and studies have uh, shown us some astounding things on the Shroud of Turin. And I want to go over them on Easter Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. At our, we're going to have our regular service time. And um, there are things that actually now date the Shroud. I know they had carbon-14 dating that said that it was 13th, 14th century. That's been disproven now. And now we have um, specific uh, information that places it uh, in the first century and uh, but after uh, 27 uh, A.D. And there, it places it uh, right in the, in the area of Jerusalem, not in, just in Israel or the Middle East. It's astounding evidence. So that uh, it, it's really compelling. And it's probably now, I would say, the fourth best argument for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'll cover those reasons why. And so we'll do that, as well as other reasons. There's the biblical arguments. I'm not throwing those aside, but wow, it's fun to look at this. So I invited people to come out to check that out, and we'll go over that. So, But to answer David's question, I threw out some of those things, why they are exclusive and why they're not considered Christian. Um, first and foremost, if somebody's defensive, come back and show them that, that by their own doctrines, um, they have said that they are they are not Christians, that they are the only true church, that they're not connected with any other Christian organization. They've denied uh, every essential of Christianity. They deny that um, Jesus is God. They deny um, that he rose from the dead. They deny the accuracy of the Bible and have, have their own New World perversion. They um, Deny the Trinity, and on and on and on. So every essential that could be there, they've denied. Um, the method of salvation, now they use the same terms, but like I said before, uh, they reinterpret those terms. And so you're left with uh, them saying something that sounds Christian, but it's not. Same thing that the Mormons do. And the Mormons are outside because they believe that Jesus is um, the brother of Satan, and that um, he is an, an ascended man who's... A God, basically, it's a, he's a quasi-man, angel thing. That they're really confused because if he's the brother of Satan, he's got to be an angel. But yet he's um, the God and man of the world. So they have real difficulty explaining that, the true character of Jesus. They, they can't. And uh, so that's one of the things at the doors you ask him to, to truly explain who he is. And don't let him off the hook. That brings us uh, to the top of the hour. Of course, you can tune in for uh, No Other Doctrine every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. We want to thank again Pastor Scott Tom for coming in, the senior pastor at Cross Christian Fellowship here in the Albuquerque area. They meet at uh, Winrock Six Theater on Indian School, uh, right uh, near the Winrock Mall. If you're uh, coming off I-40, go north on Louisiana, then east on Indian School, and you'll see the Winrock Six Theater there. Uh, they are in the theater there before the movie show there on Sunday mornings, and uh, they actually uh, take up the space in the in the lobby with uh, tables and coffee and an opportunity to just uh, share a time together uh, before and after the service. And, of course, uh, Pastor Scott, you're teaching currently now through the Book of Romans. We're going in-depth in the Book of Romans. That's been a lot of fun and uh, just uh, really showing how God deals with, with uh, man and his righteousness and how none uh, can stand before him with excuse. All are without excuse. And But we also learn how to witness to those people who take certain um, directions like, uh, uh, I don't believe there is a God, or I believe there is a God, but he can't be known. And so uh, Paul deals with all these in the first three chapters, and we're dealing with that. It's It's a good series to have because it basically explains really how to how to share your faith with each one of those individuals and and shows you how 
um, again, like we started at the beginning of the broadcast, how Christianity fits into the true um, worldview. It is the only true worldview. And if you don't have your own place of worship to attend, you're encouraged to check that out uh, tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock and listen for Pastor Scott Tom on Cross Points tonight at 8.30 and tomorrow morning at 10.30 right here on 107.1 FM. Join us uh, next Saturday morning at 9 o'clock for No Other Doctrine right here on KNKT. Thanks for joining us for No Other Doctrine. To learn more about Pastor Scott Tom and his ministry at Cross Christian Fellowship, be sure to visit our website at crossfellowship.org. We hope you'll join us again next time as we continue to explore why the doctrine of God is the only doctrine that can bring eternal life. You've been listening to No Other Doctrine with Pastor Scott Tom. For more information, visit crossfellowship.org.